So, um, I'm going to be talking to you about the importance of using brain imaging to detect the earliest stages of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I have no disclosures, and this is some of the funding from different grant agencies that have contributed to some of the data I'm going to be showing you today. So basically what I'd like to do is to just outline the need. Why do we need brain imaging to help us detect the earliest stages of Alzheimer's? I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to review some of our work in this area. And then I'm going to outline the, the uh, goals of the uh, Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative. Okay. So what is the importance of early detection? In the study of Alzheimer's disease, what we've been doing is we've essentially going backward. We used to study frank Alzheimer's disease, that is individuals with clinical AD. The problem with that is that people with Alzheimer's disease have a significant amount of pathology in their brain and neurodegeneration. So by the time of Alzheimer's disease, um, cognition is impaired across the board and as you all know, medications are not effective. So we've been studying earlier stages. In particular, one stage I'm going to talk a little bit about is called pre-symptomatic AD. What I mean by that is we're talking about individuals who are at risk for Alzheimer's disease, but are cognitively normal. They're thinking and behaving normally, but they might have genetic uh, uh, markers for Alzheimer's and a family history for Alzheimer's. Um, and so the question becomes, can we detect these people before they show cognitive changes with br subtle brain imaging uh, uh, changes? And uh, if so, can treatment be started earlier when it may be more successful? The other uh, uh, um, group we're interested in studying is individuals who are normal. Understanding individuals who are normal and normal aging is actually really important because 50% of people above 85 have Alzheimer's, 50% don't. Uh, of those 50% who don't, about 30% have enough pathology in their brain to meet uh, pathological diagnosis for Alzheimer's. So it's really important to understand how is it that those people with enough pathology for Alzheimer's still remain normal. By studying them and what we call successful aging, we may be able to tap into lifestyle variables that can help promote successful brain aging. <clears throat> um, why neuroimaging biomarkers? Neuroimaging is not the only set of biomarkers we can use to detect uh, early stages of Alzheimer's. Actually, the most accurate one is cerebral spinal fluid. It's essentially almost a perfect correlation between the cerebral spinal fluid um, and the pathology in the brain. The problem is it's very invasive. MRI, uh, by contrast, magnetic resonance imaging is not invasive. It doesn't involve exposure to radioactivity. And uh, we see subtle changes in the brain that uh, actually, as I mentioned, precede cognitive decline. There are other uh, markers as well. Dr. O'Brien, uh, who's gonna speak next, is gonna talk to you a little bit about some blood-based biomarkers. But neuroimaging and blood-based biomarkers together uh, are, are important. Um, move on. <clears throat> so our goals are essentially to, uh, are twofold, to develop imaging biomarkers of the earliest stages of Alzheimer's and to understand successful aging. Okay, so at our uh, center, which is uh, University of Kentucky Sanders Brown Center on Aging, that's after Colonel Sanders. He was a big philanthropist and donated a lot of money, I'm not kidding. Um, the brown, brown part <clears throat> is he's the guy who franchised KFC and was the governor, uh, actually. So it's all about uh, eating fried chicken and successful brain aging. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, we, have, we study these folks longitudinally. Um, we get information about blood and genetics. And one of the special things about our cohort is that, amazingly, they've all donated their brain to autopsy when they die. So we'll eventually have information about pathology in the brain that we can correlate with these imaging markers I'm gonna tell you about. So, how many people have been in an MRI experiment? Or in an MRI, period? Okay, the hands went up, yeah, okay, so a lot of folks. So as you know, MRI basically uh, is a big, uh, an MRI machine is a big magnet. That's what it is. And uh, essentially what happens is when you go in that magnet, uh, protons in your brain align with the magnetic field and then we sort of can use radio frequencies to dephase them and watch how they come back in phase and we can make pictures. Um, quite pretty pictures, uh, I think you would agree. So what we can look at is we can look at different things. We can look at the volume of the brain. That's the simplest thing to look at. And actually the brain atrophies as we age and uh, in particular regions of the brain show shrinkage for in people who have Alzheimer's. 
uh, in, in the medial temporal lobes. We can also look at the function of the brain. So that is if we ask you to do a task while you're in the scanner, like remember a word or switch between multiple different tasks, we can sort of see how your brain behaves when, when it's challenged and um, uh, how it compares to people who are younger or uh, uh, in other groups. One of the newer techniques we're using is called diffusion tensor imaging. And that's what we see here with uh, uh, these, uh, these connections here. This is basically connections in the brain. So white matter fibers that connect different regions of the brain that allow us to pass signals. If these degenerate, then essentially the brain is not passing signals between regions effectively. I want to tell you about one study done by a graduate student of mine. <clears throat> she traced different structures of the brain and essentially what she looked at was individuals were all normal when they were in the scanner, but five years later, about, half, about 30% of them uh, uh, had uh, an early form of Alzheimer's disease. So we could compare the two groups and essentially ask people who were normal but showed subtle brain changes and what were those brain changes that predicted Alzheimer's? And by combining different uh, uh, variables, uh, she found high accuracy uh, of 90% in different regions of or, or a region called the hippocampus, different substructures of the hippocampus in classifying these folks. And that's higher than we actually found with the neuropsychological tests. But combining these two together, we get 93% accuracy in um, uh, classifying people who actually were normal but would go on to later have Alzheimer's. Uh, briefly here, what this study found, it's another study where we looked at these, the connectivity. These green regions we see are just the white matter tracts in the brain, and the other colors indicate damage to those tracts in people who were, again, normal, but who were at genetic and familial risk for Alzheimer's disease. I mentioned before we want to look at successful aging. One of the things that we're looking at that is of... Um, real relevance to the Pennington with your interest in metabolism and, and, and fitness is exercise. And um, in this kind of a study, seniors or, or, or younger folks can go on the treadmill and essentially do a stress test. And we can get information about um, how long they can be on the treadmill and um, how well their lungs are taking in oxygen. In one study, um, my graduate student correlated this with, um, again, these white matter connections in the brain. And the, the regions that you see in red here are the regions that he found that seniors who were normal uh, but are sort of um, uh, aerobically fit showed higher connectivity um, than seniors who were uh, aerobically less fit. So uh, this region is really important because it actually connects the two sides of your brain uh, and allows them to communicate. So uh, exercise, there's increasing evidence that it can promo help promote successful brain aging. How am I doing for time? A couple more minutes. Okay. I want to finish off by talking about Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, or ADNI. It is um, uh, a study that is a, a collaborative study between the National Institutes of Health and um, <clears throat> pharmaceutical companies and private foundations. It is a very large study, and uh, it is... It's, it had two aims. The original ADNI was to define biomarkers that could be used to actually assess the effectiveness of treatment. But the later stages of ADNI uh, have moved more toward I was, what I was mentioning before, pre-symptomatic detection. And so the new goals of, of the new ADNI studies are to use biomarkers to try to look at pre-symptomatic Alzheimer's, again, with this focus on trying to understand who, based on brain images or blood, is likely to get Alzheimer's in the future because treatments may be more effective then. Um, <clears throat> this is a map of uh, centers <clears throat> that are involved in ADNI. <clears throat> and there's, I think, approximately 34 in the United States and four in Canada. And this is the part of the talk that I call shameless self-promotion. Uh, uh, we in uh, Kentucky are actually the second leading enrolling site. So we're enrolling a lot of seniors, we're getting brain images on many of them and sharing this database with other investigators. Uh, your own IDRP here, uh, Institute for Dementia Research, now has imaging facilities and um, Dr. Keller is very interested in uh, eventually being part of ADNI. Why is it important to be part of ADNI? What benefits are there? Um, this, this is the different phases of ADNI, and the numbers are not really important. They're from a specific center, but 
it shows different um, uh, brain imaging techniques, and you can see that now many techniques are being used. In particular, um, glucose metabolism, which is basically how the brain takes up uh, sugar, um, uh, the function of the brain with fMRI, amyloid binding, and this diffusion tensor imaging that I was telling you about. We're able to correlate these things ultimately with um, uh, the cerebral spinal fluid and with some of these blood biomarkers that Dr. O'Brien will be telling you about. And um, it's going to allow for some, some pretty powerful uh, analyses. So the importance are uh, gathering all this longitudinal data where you can see changes in the brain over time and develop biomarkers to predict uh, a change. One of the amazing things about ADNI is you don't have to have any formal affiliation with the study to be part of it. So even if you're not part of an ADNI center, if you're a qualified investigator and you want to analyze data, all you have to do is basically send an email and they'll check you out and uh, a couple days later you'll get an email back, you'll have a login and uh, you'll be able to access all this data. Um, so, uh, uh, very, very uh, great for people even who are not at aging centers. What are the obstacles to using imaging to detect uh, early Alzheimer's? One is developing the right set of biomarkers. Everybody has different studies. Not every study gets replicated. Everyone has their own idea what the biomarker should be. But this is going to be worked out. With ADNI, um, uh, we're going to develop uh, the best set of biomarkers that will predict Alzheimer's. The trickier issues are going to be issues that relate not to science, but to actually um, uh, 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 laws and politics. So one of the tricky issues that Eric Ryman has written about is basically is how do we convince regulatory agencies to um, uh, uh, conduct studies on pre-symptomatic Alzheimer's and administer treatment. What they want to see, regulatory agencies, they want to see if a new medication is successful, they want it to be successful in taking someone with Alzheimer's and reducing their cognitive decline. That may happen, but in the, in the meantime, it's important that we change the game a little bit so that the tre it should be we have a biomarker, we administer the available uh, therapies in individuals who are at high risk, and we see no change over time. That could be an important change in terms of uh, 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 the way things are going. And then the other obstacle is money. Uh, uh, more generally, it's MRI is expensive. And so um, uh, uh, my uh, dream would be is if seniors had, as part of Medicaid, uh, uh, semi-annual brain scans that would help us uh, put the whole picture together. Uh, I want to thank some of the people who contributed to this data in my lab and other collaborators at the University of Kentucky, especially the uh, participants at the Sanders Brown Center on Aging. And in particular, I want to thank uh, everybody at the Pennington and the uh, Institute for Dementia Prevention, Dr. Keller, for inviting me to this wonderful conference and you for being here. Thank you very much.